to Sounds Heal Podcast. I am your host, Natalie Brown, and I want to thank everyone for tuning in to previous episodes. The last one with Three Trees was a wonderful conversation about his life going from rock star to finding deeper connection in a divine calling through music and sound. And I'm looking forward to following him on his journey and what he does next. Today, I want to welcome Anne Dyer to the podcast. I came across Anne and her work when I was going down a rabbit hole or chasing another lead in my own search and study of using sound therapeutically, and specifically connecting through using my voice, through listening, stillness, becoming more sensitive to energies and vibrations. As I was developing my own understanding and practice, I came across Nada Yoga, the yoga of sound. I was captivated as I looked more and more into Nada Yoga. Now, there's not a lot of resources, not a lot of current texts or resources on Nada Yoga, but I did find some. And I saw that Anne was actively practicing and teaching this. I watched some of her videos on Gaia TV. And this excitement I had led me to Rishikesh, India. To the Nada Yoga School, where I did my yoga teacher training. And that's where I began to get a grasp of yogic sound practices and philosophies. That's where I began the sitar. But my understandings of Nada Yoga continued to develop when I returned home, deciding to teach a series of classes locally as an introduction to Nada Yoga. That is when I had to synthesize all I had learned, both from India, from books and resources, my own practices and experiences and takes on things. And what I have found to be an amazing resource is Anne's class, through Nada Yoga in Montreal, Canada. It is, in my mind, the most concise, thorough, well-put-together course to get an understanding for this vast subject of sound yoga. Part lecture, part practice and techniques, both from a yogic perspective, but also many exercises that are relevant, relatable, and personal, I just really enjoyed that course with her, and I wanted to invite Anne to learn more about her sound journey, her experiences, and for listeners to have an opportunity to explore sound yoga. So, Anne, thank you for joining me today. Well, thank you so much for the invitation, Natalie. Yeah. I would love to start, you know, I just know a little bit about your background and your career as a professional vocalist um, and recording artist. I'm just really curious um, about your sound progression from beginning to where you are now. If you could just tell us a little bit about the highlights. Uh, Sure. Um, It's kind of a long, convoluted story, so I will try to uh, compress it. (laughs) I, uh, my interest in, in the power of sound and music really start when I, started when I was a child. I had a, uh, a very strong connection uh, to both music and also to silence. And I started exploring it on my own uh, at a very young age, you know, say six, seven, eight. Then I sort of put that aside and went to college to get a good degree in dance. By the time I was just about to graduate from college, I actually discovered I had a fairly decent singing voice in terms of having a voice that I could perform with. And uh, that was the first I had actually realized that. For all my experimentation as a kid, I I never realized that I had any particular talent. Uh, So... Shortly after leaving college, I threw myself into uh, being a professional singer. So I had a long career as a singer, um, a jazz singer initially, and 
as I developed as a musician, my music got more and more eclectic, uh, and somewhere in there I started studying classical Indian voice, and that started coming into my music. But I had stopped dancing, and I needed something physical to do. So I found myself uh, picking up yoga asana to replace the dancing. And as I got deeper and deeper into yoga, I started to discover this aspect of yoga that had to do with sound, including mantra and kirtan and these things. And, of course, I got terribly excited. Uh, it just seemed like the, you know, the perfect portal for me uh, to delve deeper into yoga. So I started getting really involved uh, as, in pursuing more uh, about using sound as a yoga practice. And as you mentioned earlier, it actually was not so easy to find. Um, I was um, studying with uh, a teacher of classical Indian voice who began teaching me more and more from a yogic perspective when I started expressing my interest because the foundation of classical Indian music actually is rooted in uh, yoga principles. So that's where I really started to get um, a solid start. And then from there, uh, pursued it quite a bit on my own. I found it difficult to get um, uh, skillful uh, teaching uh, on the subject and in the United States. And so I did quite a bit of self-study, quite a bit of uh, delving into old texts and experimenting with practices that I read about, experimenting with developing my own practices, uh, until eventually I started feeling confident to bring this into my yoga classes. Because in that, during that time, I also started teaching yoga asana. Uh, and then it continued to develop and to the point where I felt confident that I, I had enough to share that I could start teaching workshops on um, these various practices using sound in the yoga tradition. And that's kind of uh, the short version of how I got here speaking with you. Mm. So there, there were, must have been something, you, were, you said you got some classical Hindustani training. Um, was there a, a connection you found in that moment that, that really transformed you and, and led you down this path. Do you remember that feeling? Absolutely. And I actually, I, I sort of skipped over 25 years <laughs> of a professional career as a vocalist. Uh, that is part of that. And that is, uh, as my music became less and less traditional, what I found myself pursuing as a professional vocalist, as a performer and recording artist, was music that shifted people's state of mind. That's what I really became interested in. And this was before, really, I was even that aware of Nada Yoga. This is uh, sort of outside of... Uh, formal confines of Nada Yoga or even Indian music in my own music. So in my own music, I was being um, inspired more by people like John Coltrane and late Miles Davis and um, moving in that direction, uh, who were also jazz artists who were, were interested in a more, you know, for lack of a better word, spiritual component or to the music. Um, so I had already begun experimenting in my own genre with that, and um, in original music also. That was sort of the highest compliment I felt when I was performing. It's, once in a while, somebody would come backstage after a concert and say, I, I don't know what that was, but I just experienced it. Mm -hmm. Something crazy was going on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was... I was already sort of headed in that direction, and then I started studying uh, classical Indian voice. And, uh, I mean, I can remember my second lesson, which, by the way, was also a confluence, came about as a confluence of, of, of 
these two aspects of my life because I was invited to go to India to sing at a jazz festival. So the first time I went to India was to perform at what was called at the time the Jazz Yatra in uh, Mumbai. And I thought I would take the opportunity to stay in India for a couple of months and get kind of a running start on um, uh, studying Indian vocals. And I remember when I was in, at that time, I was in Mumbai, I took, I think it was my second lesson, and my teacher started singing this particular raga, and it was like the tears just leapt from my eyes. Mm. I mean, it seems like they were just projectile. Um, from the, the, my experience of the pure sublimity of this particular raga. And so um, at that point, I was completely and utterly hooked. Um, and I knew that this music had a lot more to do than just entertainment. Right, right. And, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, jazz, you know, is so, so complex. People think about improvisation and you're just making making things up, which is a great ability. But there's the technique to it and the, the theory to it, um, which is also true about classical Indian music, that they're to really be able to let go and to get into that deeper meaning, you do need to have uh, an understanding of, of the discipline. So it's, I mean, don't you think there is kind of a, a relation between jazz and classical Hindustani? Very much so. Um, of, of course, like all things, you know, different people can come at it with different intentions, mm -hmm. wanting different things. Just like yoga is asana, people can come to it with, you know, different aspirations. And so it can come out looking or hearing very different, sounding very different. Um, but jazz and Hindustani music definitely share the improvisational component. And, and I think also the... Uh, the, the, the sense of um, commitment, full commitment, that it, it's really your life. You live and breathe it. And, and as you mentioned, that um, it's not a free-for-all. You know, there's some very, very important um, theoretical understandings, underpinnings, uh, both conceptual and theoretical, that, um, you know, you can make music without them. But to have that underpinning uh, brings uh, a certain clarity and depth to the improvisation, typically, that won't be there if you skip that step. So oftentimes I point to the example of Cecil Taylor. You know, Cecil Taylor was... Uh, you know, what used to be described as a very avant-garde pianist, uh, won the MacArthur Genius Award. And his playing was, you know, hardly recognizable from what, it, what people would think of as jazz. It had become so abstract. But this is what he was hearing because he could play every single style of jazz piano. He knew the Alpha and Omega. Mm -hmm. uh, he had lived it. He had embodied it. And so what was coming out was, you know, something that had the, um, the gravitas mm. of, of all that study and all those hours and all that commitment. Yeah, so in, yeah which is sound yoga in a way, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. the, the understanding but ability to let go. Yes. And at the same time, the beautiful thing about sound yoga um, is that because we're all human, uh, we all have an innate response to sound. Mm. So you don't have to spend 30 years studying theory or um, practicing mm -hmm. to have a sublime experience. Um, you can have a sublime experience the first time. So it's sort of a both and mm -hmm. with sound yoga. Yeah, and that gets us into what we both mentioned is 
there I, I suppose there's more and more information about it now, but it's such a vast and deep subject, right, of a philosophy and a practice. If somebody was to ask you, what is sound yoga, how would you answer that? Well, um, sound yoga was a phrase that I just kind of coined to describe all the various types of uh, practices within the yoga tradition that involve sound and the principles that, the underlying principles about sound um, for those various practices. So sound yoga for me is something very specific. Um, that it is the principles and the practices involving sound within the yoga tradition. But I have to add, or I should say and I have to add, that these principles and practices are found throughout the world. They're not, uh, they're not uh, unique to India or to the yoga tradition. But the important thing about it is that the yoga tradition is is so incredibly refined. The understanding of sound and the ways to manipulate it um, are so refined. Uh, the, the 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 gurus uh, throughout time uh, were so insanely masterful at how to use sound to to shift our experience subtly. Into, into different modes of consciousness. But you will find that in other places around the world. I mean, virtually every spiritual tradition, every spiritual tradition I know of, uses sound to shift awareness in a, in a, in a more um, subtle, to, to bring about more subtle states of awareness. Yeah, and you're right, though, the... In the yogic traditions, it's it's ref, it's refined, and over it's been over thousands of years that sound has been acknowledged and incorporated in all yogic yogic paths. So, why do you think it's becoming more popularized now in the West? Right, it's been around for thousands of years, but why do you think we're hearing so much about sound these days? I think there's a few reasons. I think it's a really good question, too. Um, when yoga first came to the West at the turn of the 20th century, uh, you know, it was packaged, like most things, <laughs> for consumption. <laughs> it, was packaged, it was packaged for Western consumption. And the, um, the chanting was off-putting to the Western population. It was too religious. It was too Hindu. It was too foreign. Um, and it was also, you know, what took, what really took hold in the West is something we're real comfortable with, especially in the U.S., uh, which is athletic endeavor, the body. So that really took hold. And, and some of the philosophical stuff, you know, sort of so light, so philosophy light, um, also found its way into the West because the West, I didn't, there was a population of people that were sort of yearning for um, a different way. But the chanting uh, didn't didn't really make it into the fold. That was sort of eliminated. That was set aside. Um, and it made people uncomfortable for a good part of the 20th century I remember in, in, in my own lifetime teaching yoga um, only 20 years ago. I was very reluctant to chant any kind of yoga chant in class. I could visibly see people getting uncomfortable uh, because they were concerned, is this a cult? Am I being, you know, do I have to convert? Is this a religion? Um, you know, and a lot of... Uh, lack of understanding, you know, am I worshiping an elephant had a god now? Uh, you know, that largely people got into yoga because they were looking for fitness. That would be the, and still to this day, that's typically the first entry point. People come to yoga because they think it's something healthy to do for their body, physically healthy. 
and then they slowly start to open up to some of the other aspects of yoga. However, since 20 years ago till now, the receptivity is so much greater. Um, I nearly never notice anybody getting uncomfortable in class if I chant or if I have them chant. Now, some of that's probably because I've become so comfortable and I, I'm also experienced in ways to make them comfortable so they can receive it. But I also think that the world is changing. And that, first of all, the world is getting smaller. You know, we're getting more and more globalized. We're becoming more and more aware of different people's traditions and being less and less um, frightened of them in, in some circles. In other circles, not so much. Uh, it's actually getting worse. But uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the yoga world in the West, uh, people are getting much more comfortable with chanting and actually wanting to learn more about chanting and really responding well to it because it fills a hole in their lives. Um, so it's sort of a, because there is such a, a contrast between where yoga came from, its origins, and where the uh, 21st century global world is now, it's at once a little difficult and on the flip side, extremely rewarding. Well, I, I think you are alluding to just how um, scattered and multitasking we are right now. What What is it about these practices that are so important right now? What is it that it that it does that it simplifies or slows down for us? Well, it does so many things, but to to, to understand, I think, I, uh, why it's such a, a powerful and helpful thing right now is to understand again that so much of this tradition came from an oral culture. It came from a culture where writing had not even been invented. And um, with writing became our propensity to be more and more, to live more and more in the realm of ideas, to live more and more in the realm of abstraction. Now we're in the information age. We're in the technological age. So... Where we are now it is it couldn't be more different from the world when these ideas, these concepts, and these practices, these experiences were forming. Um, so a few uh, hallmarks of the the time that we're living in right now is uh, in the information age, uh, meaning is really important. You know, we're looking for content. We're looking for uh, linguistic meaning. A lot of the power of sound yoga doesn't have anything to do with meaning. It has to do with the pure experience of sound itself without it telling a story or giving a lesson or having any symbolic meaning at all. That's super important for us right now because we're so riveted on information, on this particular type of information, rational, inf linguistic, verbal information, that we forget, increasingly forget, that there's other ways of knowing. There's other, other ways of knowing besides reason, besides uh, the rational mind. And not only other ways of knowing, but just other value in life apart from information. So where you see this is, for example, increasingly we communicate visually. We communicate by email, by text. And, uh, you know, they say you can't separate the message from the messenger. So the way we're relating to one another starts to shift if we're just emailing and texting. Because we're not 
hearing that person's voice. We're not feeling, hearing the inflection. We can't hear if they're lying or not. We can't hear if they're warm, warming to us or not. We can't see their expression. Uh, all the other components of communication besides simply linguistic content are not there. They've been stripped from the communication. So um, this has the effect of kind of flattening uh, or, 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 or I kind of want to want, use the word ma making that interaction more shallow, more surface. It would be like if you read a Martin Luther King speech, which of course is, you know, just rich and life with the beautiful content. So it's not like it doesn't have depth. It has that particular type of depth. But compare that to listening to Martin Luther King deliver his speech. Mm -hmm. Completely different experience. So that's one way in, in, in the world that we live in. It has an enriching quality and it and it brings us back to this, uh, you mentioned earlier, the power of the voice, uh, what the power of the voice holds for us. But, but there's other, other reasons, too, that it's particularly helpful for us right now in this particular time. Because another thing about the time that we live in is it's a highly, uh, related to what I just said, it's a highly visual time. So we privilege the visual, we privilege the visual, and we pri privilege the tangible. So when we say something is immaterial, that both means that it's not tangible, and it also means that it's irrelevant. So there's this tendency, like if I can see it, I'll, I'll see it when I believe, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it, rather. I'll believe it when I see it. So if I can see something, if I can touch something, it's real. But if I if I uh, am hearing something, there's the notion that it's not quite as real. It's not quite as real. It's not quite as permanent. Um, and there's all kinds of um, enriching things lost with that um, unconscious attitude. And we all have these unconscious attitudes. We don't even realize it because it's the water we're swimming in. Uh, I mean, for example, the so many of the yoga texts were not written. We talk about text. We picture a book. But they weren't written texts. They were composed orally, and they were passed down orally. And one of the characteristics of an oral tradition is that it is, it's adaptive. So it shifts according to location and, and history and um, who we're speaking to. Um, and that's considered a good thing to keep it relevant. Um, when we start believing that anything written down is a fixed truth, that becomes problematic. And again, that's a lot of the problems we're seeing in the world right now are sort of rooted in that idea. Um, so those are a, a, a couple a, a couple of ways that, that these practices can be particularly helpful um, right now in this time where we we privilege sight, we privilege the, the rational, the, you know, uh, reason as being the only way of knowing. We uh, are always looking for uh, conceptual meaning, and sound yoga really is an experience of these all of these other dimensions of meaning and of experience. And so let's let's break that down a little bit. Um... A lot of people know about mantras and chanting, and I guess starting with that, why is connecting to our voice 
such an important experience. And so some people have fear. Um, they have constriction when it comes to their voice. Why is it Absolutely. so important to be in tune with our own voice, do you think? Because if you go back, if you go all the way back to the Vedas, which are the foundational texts from which a lot of these sound ideas sprang, the goddess Vox is, is, the, is the goddess or the energy of sound and word. And, she, and there's a wonderful um, chant, um, a hymn uh, in the Vedas where Vox is speaking. And over and over and over in this chant, she, you're hearing the word aham, aham. Aham rudre birvasu vishcharam yaham. It goes on and on. Aham means I am. I exist. So sound is, from the beginning in this tradition, uh, regarded as an expression of existence, of I amness. Even go back further than that, more essential than that is Om. Uh, Om is the sound of uh, the universe, the existence of the universe. So it's really going back to the very beginning to, to, to sound is to express my presence, to express my existence. Before I've said anything at all, before I even know language, a baby comes out and announces, I exist. I'm here. I mean, that's the first thing that, that people are, 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 are watching for when a baby is born. You know, they want to hear it. Um, there's a wonderful uh, the linguist named Walter Ong who, who talks about um, this, this uh, phenomenon of sound uh, connoting presence in oral traditions. And he points to uh, the hunter uh, killing a lion. So if a lion is, is dead, you can still see it and you can still touch it, and you can still smell it, and presumably you can still taste it, but you cannot still hear it. So that roar of the lion is, is uh, presence itself. So if we're not allowed to have a voice, and, you know, we can point to a lot of places in, in, to this day in society where people don't have a voice, it's denying their existence, mm. you know, in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I tell my students, I mean, imagine if you were a, a dog and you were told you're not allowed to bark. Mm -hmm. And in, and for us, what comes up so much is, oh, I don't have a beautiful voice. I, I'm tone deaf. You know, I was told not to sing. You know, my second grade teacher, and in my case, in my case, my second grade teacher told me to stop singing. Um, can you imagine, you know, like putting that on a, on a, on a dog or a, or a cat or a cow, say, you know, your bark is not beautiful enough. You're not allowed to bark anymore. Mm. It's, it's an expression of, of who we are and it's an extremely human expression. So to be connected to our voice is to, to, to not only be connected to our, our mere presence, but our humanity. So it's extremely powerful. And I feel like I know I, I, I speak passionately about <laughs> this. Uh, I just feel it's a tragedy. It, 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 it's just tragic for someone to be told that they can't sing. Well, it seems pretty common, too. And it's very common. And the interesting thing about it is that as human beings, we've sung since the beginning. I mean, anthropologists show us evidence that there's reason to believe that from the time human beings existed, they always sang and sang with each other and sang every day, sang for work, sang for worship, sang for celebration. And it was a very short time ago in our history that that began to stop, which was just like 150 years ago. 
Um, and singing then became something that, for the elite, uh, I mean, I think that there were, I think it was more, a little more gradual than some, some people say, well, this really only started 150 years ago with the invention of the phonograph. Mm-hmm. But I think it, it certainly started before that when writing was invented and then the printing press was invented and it became, we stopped telling stories so much. We stopped entertaining ourselves and using song as a way to, um, uh, both educate and entertain. I mean, I and and then the gramophone came along, and now people were buying records of people who had extremely beautiful and virtuosic voices. So then, instead of singing ourselves, then we would put on a record uh, to be entertained. And then then this this divide between professional singers and everyone else uh, just became this this chasm. Uh, and it, part of that is also the commodification of the voice. Uh, when I was active as a singer and I would be at a party and somebody would say, well, what do you do? And I'd say I was a singer. The very first question out of their mouth, 99% of the time would be, oh, do you make a living at it? <laughs> and then that will, you know, then I was sort of sized up as, well, do you really sing? If you make money at it, then you really sing. Mm-hmm. If you don't make money at it, maybe you shouldn't be doing that. What's the, the implication? So that's the one of the really big difficulties with bringing this tradition into the, the I, I, I want to say the West, but really it's global society now, um, is that we have all these unspoken, unconscious understandings around sound and voice that we're not even aware of. So one of the most challenging parts with my teaching this subject is I feel it's so very important to become aware of the context that we're um, taking these lessons in from. Uh, Because uh, sound yoga practices can very quickly turn into uh, an ego reinforcing endeavor. I mean, just like yoga asana. Mm-hmm. You can go in the yoga asana, it could just be another reason to show off, right? right? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, some the sound yoga practices also have that propensity, uh, particularly since we revere our, our professional musicians so much. Right. So then kirtan doesn't become personal practice, kirtan becomes another concert where I'm watching someone I revere and buying their records mm. and who, you know, who's famous and who's not famous. You know, all those same issues now have come into my spiritual practice. Sure. In your classes, do you see people possibly struggle with that at first and then blossom into their their own voice? I used to see a lot of struggle, but I don't see so much struggle anymore. And and I think part of it is how the yoga world is changing, and part of it is that I've learned how to present these practices in a way that take the charge out, you know, to really let them know right up front, okay, this is the practice. This is why we do it. This is what you could or perhaps not experience. It has zero to do with how beautiful your voice is. However, I always, also always tell them in point of fact, although we're all concerned about how beautiful our voice is, and that's really not that relevant, it's not relevant at all to this particular practice, the fact of the matter is, in my in my experience, and I've taught hundreds and hundreds of people voice, I believe everybody has a beautiful voice. I think once we, re, we were able to, you know, it's sort of like studying meditation. Um, you know, ultimately, you're trying to calm the thoughts, but if you are trying to calm the thoughts, you can't calm the thoughts. So we're worried about how beautiful our voice is, 
In fact, it doesn't really matter how beautiful your voice is. And what happens is you end up having a very beautiful voice. <laughs> because when we relax, um, our true voice comes through. And our individual voices are, as I was saying earlier, such a immediate expression, such an unmitigated expression of who we are. That that beauty, that individual beauty comes through, that unique beauty comes through in our voice. Uh, it's like uh, singing to your baby. You know, babies want to hear their mother's voice. They don't want to hear a recording. That's the most beautiful voice in the world to them, their mother's voice. So I think if we, if, if in leading, if, if anyone listening is someone out there who is trying to introduce their student to chanting, um, if you spend a little bit of time with them explaining what the practice is and that it really doesn't have to do with virtuosity or singing, sometimes I tell my students, don't even, it's not even singing. Don't even use that word because we get we kind of tripped up on that. Uh, I think that helps immensely in getting people to relax and just go with it. What is it about chanting that is so beneficial to us? Well, I think chanting works on many different levels, and uh, there's many different forms of chanting, each of which works a little bit differently and may affect one level or the other more so. I mean, I think chanting from its most basic level is really relaxing. So it's on a bodily level, on a pure bodily level, Chanting uh, soothes the nervous system. So no more than, and nothing else than that, no more than that. Uh, chanting is good for us because it's deeply relaxing, and most of us are, as you were saying, overextended, high-strung, scattered. So it helps us take that first step to just be comfortable in our own body and be present in our own body, bring the attention into our body. And again, part of that has to do with your relationship to sound. So talking about the difference between how do people experience sound way back when to, compared to now. Now we think that sound is something that we just experience through our ears. But when you get deeper into sound yoga practices, you realize, oh no, sound is actually something I experience in my whole body. I'm sensing the vibration of the sound in my whole body. So that's, uh, uh, that vibration is running through my nervous system, and depending on what the sound is, uh, it's either relaxing me or it can be putting me into higher alert, uh, like a, the sound of a siren. So uh, anything that brings us deeper into our body in this day and age, I think, is really important because most of our lives are highly mental. Um, and we spend a lot of our time in yoga just trying to own our own body, you know, experience our own body. Um, but it has a lot of other benefits. Another really big issue these days is the sense of isolation. Again, part of the technological era, uh, among other things. And there is nothing that will make you feel m more held, more part of, more in t good company than singing together chanting together, even if you're just singing happy birthday mm -hmm. in a group, you know, you have that moment where, you know, that unified moment where you're connected to these other people and singing uh, something uh, sweet and generous as happy birthday. I mean, it's an expression of love, happy birthday. So you can almost think of happy birthday as a chant. Um, so when we come together and chant and Thing. We feel a really strong sense of connection. We feel a vibrational connection, and we feel a heart connection. 
so much of chanting is heart-based. Really all of chanting is heart-based. And our voice, you were asking what's so important about connecting to our voice, our voice also, if we're relaxed, uh, the pitch of our speaking voice will vibrate primarily, the epicenter of the vibration will be heart level. So speaking, singing, um, a lot of it resonates in the heart, comes from the heart, vibrates the heart, moves into the heart. Chanting, singing uh, is a very um, human experience. It awakens our humanity. And our humanity is thought to be experienced in the heart. Then chanting also has the capacity for clarifying the mind, bringing clarity, bringing clarity, bringing understanding. Tantric meditation, all of these things I'm talking to you about have many different facets, so I'm speaking in very broad terms. Mm -hmm. Mantric meditation's uh, concern is primarily with creating clarity of mind. Although different mantras have slightly different flavors, the biggest, most obvious benefit of mantric meditation is that the mind becomes very quiet, very clear. So uh, sound healers can also be used to, to, to create lucidity, to create clarity. And in that clarity, ultimately, historically, then you would start to have some insight, some viveka insight into the nature of yourself, into the nature of your life, into the nature of uh, existence. Also, some of the more uh, lengthy mantras, like the Gayatri mantra, do have meaning. They do have lessons embedded in them. So to chant um, the Gayatri mantra, mantra, some of the mantras in the Upanishads, the uh, Shantipat, which are the uh, peace chants. Um, these chants hold lessons for us. And by chanting them, um, we, it's like we digest those lessons. It's like the more you chant it, the more you commit it to heart. You know it by heart. So now that lesson and that chant, you don't have to jog your memory. Oh, what was that again they were saying? It's like, no, you. this has now become a part of you. You've embodied it. You know it by heart. And the profundity of those chants becomes deeper and deeper the more you chant them. So chanting is also a way of uh, learning and knowing so it operates on uh, many, many different le- levels. It's also uh, used in Ayurveda uh, to affect one's health. Mm. So you can chant to address health issues as well. And sound yoga has more parts than chanting, right? There's actually many elements, uh, whether it's breath work or deep listening. Um, I think I've heard Nada Yoga referred to as both active and receptive, right? Actively participating or being receptive through through deep listening and inner work. Do you kind of have After. a way you break that down, the different elements? Because it's not just uh, mantras. Yes, yes. And that's so important. I'm so glad you brought that up. The word nada, nada yoga, specifically refers to listening practices that, that were described in the Hatha Yoga texts of the medieval period. So Nada Yoga, in its traditional sense, means deep listening, deep listening practices. And, there's, and there, there are several of those, and they're quite profound. But I want to say, before I even get into silence and listening practices, in their, in their purity, that even when you're doing the more active practices, 
of, say, mantra japa, mantric meditation, listening is still two-thirds of the practice. So when you're chanting a mantra, maybe one-third of your energy, one-third of your practice is in the actual execution, actively speaking the mantra, chanting the mantra. Two-thirds of your attention is on listening to that chant coming out of your mouth. Or as that practice progresses, you actually don't chant it audibly. You actually mentally chant it. So you're listening. All of the sound yoga practices are weighted more heavily in listening than in making sound. Does that make sense? Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, again, if you go back to being a concert musician, it's the same thing, uh, particularly in Indian music, particularly in, uh, in, uh, in any sort of improvisational music, two-thirds of your attention is listening. And listening corresponds to silence, and silence corresponds to empty space. So in all of yoga, silence, stillness, the space between holds a really um, foundational place, a really important place. So these uh, deep listening practices, again, are something that you'll see in spiritual traditions all over the world. Silence and uh, deep listening is common in spiritual practices. Uh, again, in yoga history, in the yoga tradition, they're so refined, they're so specific. So the... Uh, and I, again, I'm right now I'm just talking to you about historically, traditionally, but then we should really bring it back to the here and now. Uh, these Hatha yoga deep listening traditions are quite esoteric and um, the reason you don't hear more about them is is most yoga teachers in um, the West don't really know much about them, don't practice them. But they're listening to sounds, uh, internal, internal sounds. In the same way you would listen to yourself reciting a mantra mentally, um, you're listening for sounds like the sound of your heartbeat the sound of your nervous system. Uh, you start listening for pure frequencies uh, and this starts to get a little bit um, sophisticated for the average bear <laughs> to relate to. But uh, when you become a very, very deep listener, you can hear sound frequencies that are occurring all the time within your body and outside your body. Uh, and this is what uh, is being referred to as the unstruck sound mm-hmm. in yoga philosophy. Uh, the anahata, the unstruck sound. Mm, my sense, and this is just conjecture, is that that unstruck sound is the continuing sounding of what we call the Big Bang. That the Big Bang is still sounding. If you go on the NASA website, they actually corroborate this, that the sound of the Big Bang is still reverberating. And so when you become a very subtle listener, you can actually hear these frequencies that are occurring that from an episode that happened a gazillion years ago. Mm-hmm. So the last thing I want to say about because speaking of rabbit holes, this is really a big <laughs> one. <laughs> the last thing I want to say about deep listening and hatha yoga is why why were they trying to develop their faculties to to hear such subtle sounds? Because they felt that if they could continue to get better and better at hearing these frequencies inside the body, they could ultimately hear the sound of the kundalini and the shishunna which is life force itself. So the path to perceiving uh, the divine or pure consciousness or, or pure life 
whether you're talking Shakti or Shiva or, you know, any of those um, hair-splitting entities we can get into, they felt that they could hear the sound of life itself as it reverberated in the central channel of the body. And once they reached that level of awareness, then they had arrived. They were in a state of realization. They were having a direct experience of consciousness, of the divine. So sound was the path. Sometimes I describe it like the breadcrumbs. You're following the breadcrumbs of increasingly more and more subtle sounds until you arrive at the very source of those sounds. Mm. Uh, in contemporary life, you know, maybe the average yoga student isn't that interested in cultivating a state of realization, of uh, finding the source of all life. Usually that's not on most people's mind. You know, they're just trying to get a break. You know, they're trying to find a, a corner, a moment of some peace. Uh, we, again, uh, with the technology that we're living with, it's a constant barrage of, of, of sonic information. So to, again, just to learn to respect that silence has a value that emptiness has a value, that space has a value, without it being filled with information, is uh, crucial. You know, it's like a lot of people really wish they didn't have to sleep and they could just be active 24 hours a day. Mm. (laughs) Not understanding that to be in that deep sleep where there's not even any dreaming going on is crucial Mm -hmm. to us uh, living healthy, vibrant lives. So um, I think for people to start to look for little moments of silence and to realize they don't have to automatically reach for the radio knob and turn it on in the car. They don't have to constantly have the television going. That in those moments of silence, we do start to become aware of... more internal aspects of of our life, of ourselves. There's a moment available for contemplation, which, again, all these spiritual traditions are rooted in, these moments of contemplation, the ability to look both out and in. Do you think that's a good practice for uh, someone to get into sound yoga is to simply sit in silence, which is obviously a paradox because there's always something going on in the silence, and just to to gain more sensitivity um, to the sounds around them and within them. Is that a, a good practice? I think it's a fantastic practice. And uh, I have a project in mind. I haven't shared with anyone but you. <laughs> <laughs> uh I, I'm thinking about starting something called, not a, a, a silent retreat, but a silence retreat, mm. where over the course of a long weekend, perhaps, to start with, we're actually uh, developing our relationship to silence. So silence is much more than not simply not speaking. Which is a silent retreat. The the uh, the uh, accent is on. We're not speaking, which is a good starting place. Yeah. But to take it further than that, mm. and to do an entire weekend on silence and and ways to penetrate increasing, as you said, increasing levels of silence because silence is not an absolute. Right. Mm. That sounds great. You should do it. <laughs> I think I should. Yeah. I'm glad you, uh, <laughs> you you kind of heard that I was sitting in the back of my head somewhere, yeah. and you, you brought it out. Yeah. So I think that's a great simple practice, just sitting in your own space, whether it's just a chair you're comfortable with at home, and listening, just noticing the sounds around you. What's another simple practice, maybe um, a chant that's just a great one to 
to start off with just to get deeper into chanting? Well, I think the, the best simple practice that I've seen the best results with over the years is simply chanting the vowels. Mm-hmm. Just chanting the vowels and noticing how each vowel is a different bodily experience. Different vowels resonate in your body differently. It's very simple. There's no belief There's no required. And that's something else I'm always really trying to impress upon people. This is not a belief system. You don't have to believe anything. Um, it's the pure experience of the vibration itself. And, it, and again, it'll be very calming, it's very soothing, and it starts to open up our awareness of how sound something as simple as two vowels, how they're actually being experienced by us very differently. It's a really cool experience. I mean, uh, not only are you feeling your own personal vibration that you're creating, but oh, wow, I'm feeling this one in my my chest, this one I can feel up in my my nose. And you're realizing you you can direct your own energy uh, through sound. It's a very, very cool experience. Yeah, absolutely. It is very cool. You learn that you can direct it, and you also know how to receive it. Mm. That whether you're directing it or not, it's playing upon you differently. Mm Mm-hmm. So it's a, the, the sound yoga is always very relational. There's part of it I'm doing it, I'm doing, and part of it it's doing to me. And then the other, if somebody wanted a really simple practice, uh, I, I would say just begin with chanting OM, which actually, for people who are familiar with various yogic texts, in every single yogic text I'm aware of, everything from Patanjali Yoga Sutra to the Bhagavad Gita to the Upanishads to the Hatha Yoga uh, text, they just say, hey, you know, if all else fails, chant Om. And uh, again, if one were to chant Om, it doesn't have to, doesn't have to be fancy, super simple. And you're just listening. You're just listening to the sound coming out of your mouth and you're noticing that every so often you stop listening. And you start thinking about what you're going to make for dinner, and then you bring it back. So it is a form of, all the sound yoga is a form of meditation. That's something I really want people to understand. All the sound yoga is meditation. So there's not meditation and then chanting. Chanting is meditation. So, yeah, they just chant OM, keep bringing their attention back to listening. It's a form of meditation that I have found with my students is a little easier than some other forms of meditation, like uh, focusing on the breath, because the sound is, has a little bit more materiality. It's a little easier to hold on to. It's a little easier to keep your mind on listening to that sound om than to, say, uh, watching the breath. It's a little more elusive, for, in my experience, for most students that I work with. So those are three very, very simple things people can do. Just turn on a timer, take 10 minutes, and just sit down and listen. Mm -hmm. Um, Try chanting the vowels. If you want to get a mala, you can practice doing one mala, 108 repetitions of OM. Just as a practice, these are practices. Mm-hmm. So a certain amount of structure is helpful in any practice. That's why I suggest using the timer or using the mala. A little bit of structure is helpful. And that's kind of how we started this conversation. Mm-hmm. The last topic I want to actually, I mean, we mentioned just a little bit about, you know, we're hearing so much about sound these days. And it's it's in the news, it's in medicine, you hear about sound baths. Um, my, I'm curious how you think that sound yoga um, is related to or goes beyond our recent understanding of the emerging field of sound healing. Well, in a sense, there 
two different things. And in another sense, they're related. Mm. Uh, they're two different things in that sound healing is focused on, uh, it's more, it's become more of a medical model. Uh, just like in yoga, when we have yoga therapeutics, yoga asana is looked more through a medical model lens, not in a soteriology or spiritual method lens. So they can be very different. The, the, the goals can be very different. At the same time, so it is a paradox, <laughs> at the same time, when we're stepping into any sort of spiritual practice, specifically in yoga, the body is the first thing to be addressed because it, it's hard to progress on a spiritual path when you don't feel well. You know, when you're either you're in pain or your energy's not good, um, you know, everything affects everything else. So if my body's not in great condition, and that's going to affect my mood, that's going to affect the clarity of my mind. Um, and this is, again, one of the reasons that uh, in, in the Hatha Yoga tradition, they worked so diligently on the body because the body was their instrument. So the better the instrument, the better the practice was going to be. So you could say, in a sense, that sound healing could be the first step on the yogic path. And I'm using that word, again, traditionally, historically, that the yogic path is a spiritual practice. You're, you're looking to, it's a very systematic spiritual practice to attain a state of realization. Uh, sound healing, not necessarily. Sound healing might just be um, reducing stress or um, getting rid of a rash or promoting um, heart health. So because they have different goals. Um, and I'm not that familiar with the sound healing world uh, because I'm not a yoga therapist. Um, I know a little bit about it. In the little bit that I know about it, it does seem to me that it does operate a little bit more in the framework of a medical model than some of these other practices that you and I have been talking about. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. It just seems that um, it's a buzzword that's emerging, but, you know, just how so, uh, yoga in, um, or sound in yoga studios and sound healing and sound baths in yoga studios are emerging at this increasing rate, um, it, it seems to have a connect well, I think there's some other things going on as well. Uh, one is that um, it's very accessible. Mm -hmm. So um, if somebody's interested in sound, you know, it's easy to buy a set of crystal bowls mm -hmm. and do some sound in your class. It doesn't require a tremendous amount of um, mm -hmm. practice. Mm -hmm. So it's something that's more, it's democratic. It, it, it's accessible to everyone, so it's spreading. <laughs> yeah. It's spreading quickly because, it's, because it is accessible to everyone, which is a great thing because it's, I think it's a wonderful starting place, as you were saying, uh, just to develop an awareness that sound is affecting me and that they're finding it soothing and they're finding it calming. I have personally had experiences in, in sound baths that have been, I, in my estimation, very antithetical to what we're typically trying to accomplish in yoga. Um, but that's another story. Uh, the, the other thing is that uh, we're getting more and more reports now of uh, the medical world using sound. Yes. You know, not only in sonograms, but using it to 
uh, break up kidney stones or using it to remove tumors or, you know, all kinds of interesting ways that sound is being used in medicine. So um, I think that's also, there's a big shift going on. And again, once again, not so very different from the way the Medical Association is looking at yoga asana. Mm. And, and mindfulness techniques is like, oh, no, this is not an either or. Actually, all these things can work together. I was curious, uh, what do you have coming up this year? I know you've had a variety of different projects. I, I saw that bit on your your project that you were commissioned to do uh, with the choir. What do you uh, have coming up that you're excited about? Any big projects? Well, the, the the project I'm excited about most is the silent retreat, mm-hmm. the silence mm-hmm. retreat I mentioned to you. And also, uh, I'm looking at starting uh, a blog uh, called Sound Matters, um, where I can share a lot of the things that you and I have discussed in a kind of fresh, new way. Uh, it's something that's been brewing for a long time, and I'm just now starting to make the room to make it a reality. Mm-hmm. Um, and this would be, again, something that would be an easy way for people to bring a little bit of this into their daily life. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm looking at, at launching that this year. Um, I also... I do a week-long retreat in Mexico every year, uh, Yoga and Chanting, which is both yoga asana and sound yoga. And I'm doing that uh, the first week of December. I always look forward to that because Mm -hmm. we have seven uninterrupted days to go deep. Mm. Those are a few things that are going on right now. Do you still um, do recording projects and... uh... I really, I really don't. Yeah. Um, not too much. If something comes to me, I just, I did a recording late last year. Mm-hmm. Somebody came to me with a project. Uh, it's not something I actively pursue. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, that's, I, I don't have any objection to it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, uh, it, it's just. Uh, sort of where things are at right now. It, it really, you know, way back when you were asking me, how did I get started? Mm-hmm. That was basically what happened, is I had a very active recording and performing career. And the deeper I got into sound yoga, I just started to lose interest. Mm. So I still like making music with other people. That's what I enjoy the most. I enjoy the music making. Yeah. I can, uh, and I can enjoy performing, but I don't really yearn for it. Mm -hmm. Mm. So unless something shows up at my door, uh, typically I'm not engaged in too much of that. Yeah. Yeah. Where is the best place? place for people to find you online and keep track of what's coming up for you? Andire.org uh, and also uh, my yoga studio website which is uh, my, the name of my studio is Mountain Yoga. Well great thank you so much for your time it's been really wonderful to get into talking more about these practices and philosophies from your perspective. So I really appreciate it. I hope it was helpful. Oh, yes. Well, Natalie, thanks again. And uh, I look forward to our keeping in touch. Yes, absolutely. And let me know when your silence retreat is. I'll be curious. I will. I'm so (laughs) glad that you jogged that from my memory. Like I said, it's one of those things I've been thinking about for a long while. And I'm like, yeah, we need to do this. Yeah. I will let you know. Cool. Great. Okay, take care. Okay, thanks so much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Sounds Heal Podcast. You can keep up to date with what's coming up next at soundshealstudio.com. You can listen to podcasts and 
new music every month at Sounds Heal Studio, Natalie Brown, YouTube. Thank you again for listening. Be well and stay tuned. <laughs>